Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Art and the New Negro, an online professional development seminar sponsored by the Florida Humanities Council and America in class from the National Humanities Center. My name is Richard Tram. I'm the Vice President for Education Programs here at the Humanities Center, and I'll be moderating the session this evening. <clears throat> Before we get underway, I'd like to just introduce you to the organizations that are sponsoring tonight's seminar. The Florida Humanities Council is a state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. It offers public programs to encourage Floridians to learn about their history and culture. Uh, it also offers uh, its teacher center, also provides content-rich professional development for uh, teachers uh, in the K-12 system there in Florida. Now, this seminar, Art and the New Negro, is made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities that was given to the Florida Humanities Council as part of its Landmarks in American History and Culture program. Uh, that program funded Jump at the Sun, Zora Neale Hurston and her Eatonville Roots, a seminar that was organized by the Florida the Humanities Council in 2008 and that more or less serves as the basis for the seminar this evening. Now, the National Humanities Center, on the other hand, is located in North Carolina. It is the country's only independent institute for advanced study in all branches of the humanities. It's independent, which means it's a private nonprofit organization. It's an institute for advanced study, which means that the main program we offer is a fellowship program that brings scholars to the center for uh, usually an academic year to research and write on topics in history, literature and language, philosophy, criticism of the arts, that sort of thing. Now, that may make the place sound like an ivory tower, but it's really not. We're very much interested in reaching all kinds of audiences, and we're particularly interested in reaching teachers. And we do so with our professional development programs. We offer online seminars. We offer teaching anthologies that provide you with primary resources. We also offer secondary sources in TeacherServe, and we have a new uh, offering our America in Class lessons. <clears throat> These are uh, lessons that will allow you to integrate individual or small numbers of primary documents into your lessons. You can gain access to everything the National Humanities Center offers for teachers by going to americainclass.org. There you can click on the various items and, and find all the things we offer. And you'll also find a description of what they are. So we urge you to do that, please. Now, before we get underway, let me remind you that uh, we will be recording this seminar, and you will be able to get access to that recording through the Art and the New Negro website that we developed for this seminar and through which you obtained the readings for the seminar. You will also find there the PowerPoint presentation. We invite you to plunder the PowerPoint for your own classes. That's what it's there for. You will also find an evaluation on the website. Please. At the end of the seminar, take about 10 or 15 minutes to fill out that evaluation. You can do so online and submit it to us online. It is very uh, important to us, and it also is important to the Florida Humanities Council. Now, once we receive your evaluation, we will send you documentation of participation. This will be a letter that you will be able to present to your local certifying authority to obtain whatever certification, whatever recertification credit your participation in the seminar warrants. So watch for that once we receive your evaluation. Uh, if you want to hear more about uh, Rick Powell and you want to hear more about uh, his views on art and the Harlem Renaissance and the New Negro Movement, we invite you to go to uh, the URL you see on the screen. You can gain access to that URL on the seminar form. Uh, to which, in which you participated before the seminar. Uh, this will take you to a, an interview that Rick did in 1996 on a radio program that the National Humanities Center used to sponsor, a radio program called Soundings, and that will offer additional insight to bolster what you'll be able to, uh, to learn in this evening's seminar. Now, how does the seminar work? Well, <clears throat> there'll be some lecture. Uh, we hope that there will be mostly discussion. We hope that you'll be raising questions and responding to comments that uh, Professor Powell makes. Um, you can respond by putting your cursor in the chat box. That's the box I bracketed in green at the very uh, bottom of the screen there. Type your message in. Hit, hit the Send button to the right, and your message will appear in the chat box above. 
I will be uh, following the chat. I'll be reading it and bringing it into the conversation at appropriate moments. If we don't get to your comment or question right away, it's because I'm waiting for a, a moment to jump in and interrupt Rick before I bring it in, but we'll try to bring in everything that you say this evening. Uh, so please uh, respond in the chat box there. Let us hear from you. Are there any questions before we get underway? If everybody's ready to go, shoot me one of those smiley faces so that I know we're on the, on the uh, same page here and uh, we're ready to move forward. Okay, I begin to see some, there we go. All right, great, well let's get underway and learn about art and the new Negro movement. Our goals this evening are simple, we have two goals. First of all, we want to deepen your understanding of the ways in which the new Negro movement expressed itself in the visual arts. And second, we would like to provide fresh primary resources and instructional approaches for use with students. We have three understandings, three takeaways, things that you'll, we hope you'll take away from the seminar this evening. First of all, <clears throat> African-American culture, from the vernacular to the cosmopolitan, and from the purely artistic to the socially grounded, figures prominently in the evolution of an early 20th century modernist sensibility. So you see we're going to be taking African-American culture beyond the boundaries of African-American culture and talking about how it relates to the broader modernist sensibility that formed in the early 20th century. Despite the importance of African-American and or Harlem-based expression in the new Negro arts movement, the creative manifestations of this cultural initiative were international in scope, appearing in Europe, the Americas, and throughout the black diaspora. So we're going to be integrating the Harlem Renaissance into a geographically broader movement known as the New Negro Arts Movement. And finally, the chronological parameters of the New Negro Arts Movement span from the World War I years to the end of the 1930s. So we'll also be expanding the temporal parameters of the Harlem Renaissance. We'll be putting it, we're going to focus on it not just in the 1920s when it is typically understood, but we'll be reaching back to the years just after the First World War and the years into the 1930s. Now we had a very good discussion of the seminar of the topic on the forum. Uh, let me just pose some of the challenges and questions that, uh, that you raised on the forum. One teacher wrote, I would like to develop a unit on the Harlem Renaissance and would like ideas on the appropriate art pieces to include. Well, you've come to the right place. You're going to see a lot of art tonight, and uh, you'll be able to take your cues from that and work whatever art you think is appropriate into your unit. I want to help my students analyze visual art and utilize that as a bridge to analyzing literature. Along, with the, along the same lines, another teacher wrote, some students have a hard time interpreting art. Is there an easy way to help them? Along the same lines, another teacher wrote, I would like to move my students past the that's cool or I don't get it reaction to art so they can have a meaningful experience with the pieces. Now, on the forum, I gave you the URL for a simple four-step visual analysis uh, process that we include in our teaching anthologies. I'm not going to go into it right now, but please go back and check the form. You will find my message there. And it is really a very simple four-step way to really promote some, I think, very fruitful discussion among students uh, in your classes. And you don't have to be an art historian to use it. Take a look at it. I think you'll find it useful. Now, another teacher wrote, I would like to learn about different resources, art, music, poems, short stories, full-length novels that can be included in a unit on the Harlem Renaissance for eighth graders. Well, again, you're going to see an awful lot of material tonight. Whether or not it is appropriate for use in an eighth grade class, we can't say. Um, the teacher who wrote this is the expert in teaching eighth graders, so we offer the material and uh, we know that she'll be able to make the act of translation to bring whatever she feels is appropriate for her students into her classes. Some more comments. I'm looking for ways to connect the new Negro movement to the hip hop movement that began in the 1980s. That, does, that question doesn't figure in in general to the seminar, so we're going to turn to that question right away after I introduce Rick because I think there's some interesting parallels. I want to incorporate more art from other time periods and places. Uh, we'll be doing that this evening. Since art is your own impression and the artist's interpretation, how reliable is art in telling us about history? That's a question we'll address tonight. How has art served as a form of resistance for the African American community? We'll be addressing that as well. How does the art of the new Negro movement reflect black migration from the rural agrarian south to the urban industrial north? 
a question central to tonight's seminar. And finally, how was the art of the new Negro movement accepted in black communities? Was it embraced or denounced? Another question we'll get to this evening. To lead us through these questions, we are very pleased to have with us Richard J. Powell, the John Spencer Bassett Professor of Art and Art History at Duke University. Rick was the National Humanities Center Fellow in 1995 and 1996. He's written widely on African American history. You can see the titles of his volumes right there. And at this moment, let me turn the program over to him. Let me just locate his name here on the board and pass the baton to Rick, who will tell us uh, all about art and the new Negro movement. Rick, it is all yours. Hello, can you hear me? We can indeed hear you, and I promised the uh, participants that we would address that question about hip-hop right off the bat. So could you give us about 60 seconds? What is the relationship, if any, between the new Negro movement of the early 20th century and the hip-hop movement that got going around the 1980s? Sure, I'd be delighted to uh, attempt to answer that question. Uh, the first thing I would say is that when we look at the artists of the Harlem Renaissance, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, County Cullen, Aaron Douglas, the list goes on and on, we're talking about young artists. We're talking about artists who were in their 20s, uh, very um, idealistic, uh, very uh, provocative, and one could say that that same demographic fits the young uh, artists who emerged during uh, the 80s when the hip hop uh, movement um, comes into full flowering. Uh, so, so there's that connection in terms of youth and youthful expression. Um, the other thing that I would say is that one of the interesting parallels that I see between the 1920s in particular and the 1980s in terms of these kind of burgeoning art movements was that both of them in a strange way really reached beyond the, the beginnings of where they started. Um, the, the Harlem Renaissance, the New Negro Arts Movement um, generated a kind of, for, 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 for a great extent in the US, but then it really opened up to France, to, to, to the UK, to, to Germany, to, 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 to the Caribbean, and, and actually back to Africa. And the same thing could be said about hip hop. That, that when it, it flowers from the Bronx in the early 1980s, it, it automatically has this kind of reverberation with things that are happening in the Caribbean and in Europe and beyond. And finally, to, to use up my 60 seconds, I would say that, that the other interesting connection between the two is the kind of basis in a poetic or a language arts um, um, kind of sensibility. That, that with both the Harlem Renaissance, the New Negro Arts Movement, and, and hip hop, that, that voice and language and poetry become a diving board, become an opportunity to move beyond just language and words into music, into performance, into visuality. And, and in that way, there are these incredible resonances between those two periods separated by 60 some years. Well, great. Well, good. I, that, that, that's very interesting, Rick. I, I had no idea that the parallels ran so deep. Uh, thank you for that. Well, now, shall we move uh, back from the 80s to the 19-teens and look at the beginnings of the new Negro art movement? Absolutely. The other thing, though, that I wanted to add to what um, your wonderful introduction and the questions, um, the, particularly that question that had to do with history and art. Um, I really am grateful for that question because in some way that's the basis for our conversation tonight, that we can look at art and we can say something about a historical moment. Um, true that art is about interpretation, art is about um, ideas and, and inspiration and, and poetic or artistic license, but I would also argue that art is created in a particular time. And it's also created in a particular place. And therefore, it can be viewed as an historical document just as much as a book, as um, historical events, as people producing um, um, history and the like. And so I think the challenge is, is for us to look at these artistic expressions and to find a way to interpret them. And so hopefully tonight's conversation will get us into that, that mode of looking at images 
and thinking about how we can interpret those images in a way that will be useful for us across the humanities um, specter. And I've, I've just clicked on to uh, a poster. And this poster on the right was created in 1919. Uh, uh, it was created uh, for the Chicago Defender, a historically black newspaper. And it's, and it's advertising a movie that was done by uh, a black filmmaker by the name of, of Oscar Michaud. And Oscar Michaud was one of these um, really forward thinking, um, innovative um, men of that time period. And he wanted to bring African-American stories to the silver screen, to the photo plays as they were called in the teens and the 20s. And he made this film called Within Our Gates, which if you get a chance, I think you can actually go on YouTube and see various clips from it. But here we're just showing you the poster and we're showing you two um, photograph, film stills or photo stills. One showing at the top a very elegant couple. The, the actress is um, Evelyn Freer, who you see as the star as listed on the poster. And she here is playing a young woman who comes from Mississippi to, to the North to try to raise money for an historically black school. And, and the story shows her struggles and her challenges uh, as a black woman um, kind of trying to work her way through this modern moment. Um, the image that you see below is a very interesting image. It's a scene from within our gates that actually represents um, a scene of lynching. I mean, this was a very controversial film when it was first um, shown in Chicago. In fact, the censors worked very hard to kind of cut out some of the, the various stories and elements, including the lynching scene. But, but um, Oscar Michaud was successful in keeping um, the violence that, that, that many African Americans were experiencing during this time period um, on full view for people to see. Some of you who read um, in the book that I um, asked you to read in advance will be familiar with the term the summer of 1919, the Red Summer. And this, it was called the Red Summer because there was so much violence and so much blood spilled um, in terms of violence between racial groups during this time period. That, that African Americans really wanted people to think about the challenges they had as they, they entered the workforce, as they clashed with various um, constituencies uh, in urban centers like Chicago and, and, and other places. And so it's important for us to even begin our conversation about the um, New Negro and the art of the New Negro with some of this historical uh, background that really kind of grounds us. And Oscar Mushell's film Within Our Gates provides that for us. Rick, we have a question in the chat. What was the extent of the popularity of this film in the 20s within the white or black community? A really good question. Oscar Michaud was a true entrepreneur. He um, made these films um, on a fairly limited budget. It was a lot of money for him. But then when the films were done, he would literally travel, not just throughout the United States, but around the world, or at least to Europe and Latin America. And he would leave um, prints of these films um, from uh, in the South, uh, in white theaters. He would go to Europe. In fact, this film within our gates, we only have now because we found a copy of it in the Spanish film archive in the late 1970s. So in other words, no copy existed in the United States. Um, but we found this copy of it, uh, and it was called La Negra in, uh, in, in the Spanish film archive, and we were able to translate the, 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 the subtitles, or at least the, 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 the text titles, um, from Spanish into English uh, with, some, with some help from his archive. So Oscar Michel was an incredible wheeler dealer and entrepreneur and hustler, and he was able to sell these films and get audiences across the racial spectrum, although the focus of the film and the subject of his film were African Americans. So then it's fair to say that in Michelle we have an early example of the nationalism of the New Negro Arts Movement. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. Okay, all right, well shall we move on then? Yes, you know, as, as Richard knows, I, I like to start off this lecture not only talking about film, which you can look at on your own, but a poem. And um, I, there was one question that was raised about connecting poetry and images and, and all of the arts. And I think that, that that's very much possible in 
a discussion of the New Negro Arts Movement. And I wanted to start off with this wonderful poem by Gene Toomer, who was based um, a, well, for a period in Washington, D.C. He grew up in Washington, but then he moved to New York, and he did this poem in the early 1920s, and it's called Song of the Sun. Pour, oh, pour that parting soul in song. Pour it into the sawdust glow of night, into the velvet pine smoke air tonight, and let the valley carry it along and let the valley carry it along. Land and soil, red soil and sweet gum tree. So scan of grass, so profligate of pines. Now just before an epic sun declines, thy sun in time, I have returned to thee. Thy sun I have in time, returned to thee in time. For though the sun is setting on a songlit race of slaves, it has not yet set, though late, O oh soil, it is not too late yet to catch thy plaintive soul, leaving soon gone, leaving to catch thy plaintive soul, soon gone. Negro slaves, dark, purple, ripened plums, squeezed and bursting in the pine wood air, passing before they stripped the old tree bare, one plum was saved for me. One seed becomes an everlasting song, a singing tree, caroling softly, souls of slavery, what they were and what they are to me, caroling softly, souls of slavery. You know, as you might have gleaned from my reading, I love this poem. <laughs> and, and I love it because what Toomer does is he has this wonderful use of alliteration. These S sounds really kind of move us. Song, soul, smoke, soil, et cetera, et cetera. Sun, both S-U-N and sun, S-O-N. And as you might glean from that, this, 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 this thing in the air, this, this thing in the sky that, that gives us light and sun and, and, and heat, and, and Let's Plants Grow is being alliterated by Gene Toomer to also reference bodies and, 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 and pro, pro, progenation, a, a child, a son coming into the world. And so Toomer is moving elegantly between these two kind of um, spheres, if you will, and he's making a very important message. And that message is that on this landscape, in this landscape, there is a sense that things may not be all that we want them to be, that, that the sun is setting and, and that the narratives that are embedded in the land might disappear. But then he says, you know, um, we, can, we can hold on to this. One plum was saved for me. One seed becomes an everlasting song. In other words, this, this past, this tradition, um, the memories of slavery, the memories of all the things that African Americans experienced can be held on to and then retooled, represented into an everlasting song, a singing tree, and, and constantly referencing the past, what they were, and also the, about, the, the importance of that to the present, what they are to me. And, and, and in some ways, that poem is, in some ways, a wonderful encapsulation of the New Negro Arts Movement. Yes, we have some interesting comments in the chat. One person writes, uh, the poem seems to connote the passing of some uh, uh, and the rebirth of others. And I think that's a, a, very, a, a very insightful comment. I mean, the passing of a, of a certain era the South, slavery, and yet the, the rebirth, the coming of another era, rebirth, renaissance. And then we see the influence of the church hymn in the repetition of the last lines. Um, and then here we have another comment. As I read this poem, I was immediately taken back to the farmlands of Georgia, appropriate place to be taken back to with all the pine trees and the red clay soil, and was made by the word images. I loved it for the use of words, 
The parting soul and song describes poetry at its best, taking our words and sending them out to, the, to touch the souls of others. And then another comment, I agree with your comment about evoking earlier times that is conveyed partially by the archaism such as thy and oh. So you do have that interplay of past and present here, Rick. I think I, I love that we have all these literature well. people here because they are, they're reading everything so, so nicely. Right? <laughs> well, shall we move on then? Yes. Um, Interestingly, to go back to the war and World War I, as a prelude to the New Negro Arts Movement, I wanted to show you these two images, two very different images, and at the same time, two images that in many respects lead us into this moment, this, 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 the topic of our conversation tonight. On the left is a poster, and the poster is from France, and the poster is advertising a serial a cereal called Banania. And as you might um, suspect from the name Banania, this is a cereal that uses food products, particularly from bananas, as one of its ingredients. But the image that we're looking at is a man. And this man is eating cereal. We see him with his bowl in one hand, his spoon in another. He's sitting on a box that those of you who know French will see delicacies, food, of aliments, and, and, and so this is a box that is ostensibly holding this, 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 these foodstuffs that he's imbibing. And then we see him. And this might require a little interpretation, but what we're looking at here is a tirailleur. And a tirailleur is a soldier from West Africa who um, is conscripted by the French government because at this point, France, West Africa is under the colonial control of France. And these are soldiers who are brought to Europe to fight during World War I. And we see this fellow, and he is smiling broadly. He's wearing a fez. He's wearing his uniform. And then we see at the bottom of the poster, Yabon. Those of you who know some French might be able to take from that, extrapolate from that, that's good. And that's kind of Creole or, or West African Creole for that's good. So we have this poster celebrating this food stuff from West Africa in the guise of a black soldier from West Africa who's been conscripted by the French to fight for, for, French, for France. Uh, and all of this is encapsulated in this product. We move from that image to the image on the right. It's a black and white photograph of a painting. And the painting is by Edwin Harleston. And Harleston was an African-American artist working um, for a period in South Carolina. He also worked briefly in Boston. And here we're looking at his painting entitled The Soldier. And here is a soldier um, from World War I. It was done around 1919. So this would be around the time just before, right after the end of World War I. And if we look closely at this painting, and I know that some of you are really keen on how do you interpret a painting? Well, let's just look at this figure. And when you look at this figure, you see that his arms are folded. You see that he's at an angle. And if you could really see a good close-up of this picture, you'd see that his eyes are kind of cutting to the right. It's almost as if there's a bit of, 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 of suspect, a suspicion, a bit of, 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 of not being totally at ease with, with whatever is in front of him. And so I wanted you to look at these two images, one an advertisement celebrating this colonial product um, that is being used by one of the members of the colony in contrast to an image of a black soldier who is very much expressing in his body discontent. And so I show you these two images to remind you that before the Harlem Renaissance, we have this momentous World War I event. And yet we have peoples of African descent who are already very much tied into that cataclysmic event. On one hand, being used as a kind of a tool of, of colonialism. On the other hand, representing a bit of dis-ease and dissatisfaction and anxiety. And in fact, it was out of that anxiety that um, Oscar Michaud's film Within Our Gates is produced, that they, there is this kind of antagonism that erupts in the red summer of 1919. And so the prelude to the New Negro is, in some ways, this dialectic, this internationalism, this, this specter of colonialism, and at the same time, um, this kind of brooding um, political um, insurgency that's about to erupt and does erupt 
by the time we get into the 1920s. So we see here the internationalism and the, the beginning of a, of a self-consciousness uh, of African Americans in the beginning of the 20th century. Yes. Okay. And many um, books and many discussions of the New Negro Arts Movement begin with these two images. Um, I'll start with the one on the right. Um, some of you who, again, know literature know that we're looking at a portrait of Langston Hughes. Um, Langston Hughes was a young man, as I said earlier, who's in his 20s when he arrives uh, in Harlem. And he is fortunate enough to be kind of swept up into the moment, um, publishing poetry and, and being a part of this lively scene of young artists. And this is a portrait that was done of Hughes by a German artist by the name of Wienold Reis. And Rice, I really love the way Rice depicts Hughes. He shows him in a mode that we know already from art history, from Rodin, the thinker. Hughes' chin is in his hand. Um, there's an emphasis, there's light on his forehead. So there's almost a sense of him being very cerebral. He is um, seated at a desk, and in front of him is a, a book. Maybe it's a manuscript book. Maybe he's writing poetry. Maybe he has already written something or maybe he's reading something, but we can tell that this is a literate man. In fact, he is um, an elegant uh, gentleman by, by his clothes, the, the, the shirt, the tie, the vest, the, the, the top, the jacket. And then we see, it's hard to see in this detail, but if you look closely, we see all sorts of interesting little uh, marginalia surrounding him, these kind of art deco patterns um, that surround his head. If you look to his, um, to his left, you see something that looks like skyscrapers, a kind of an urban cityscape. If you look to the right, you see musical bars and musical notes. We see a stairwell. We see a figure in bed. We see a figure kneeling next to that figure. It's almost as if there's a little narrative, a little blues story that's been wound up into this background of Langston Hughes' portrait. In fact, the background itself is in blue. And so maybe Vino Rice here is referencing the blues and all of the things that are contained in the blues. And so I think this is an appropriate way to begin a discussion of the New Negro Arts Movement representing this young New Negro, Langston Hughes himself. And the other thing that I want to emphasize is new, because here we see the beautiful, elegant clothes. We see the Art Deco background that reminds us of the Chrysler building or shiny cars. Or, or, or other kinds of new modern appliances of the 1920s. And so that's very much a part of this, this mindset, this, this, this mentality, this sensibility that then gets layered onto African Americans and then it gets expressed in the arts. But the image to the left is a little different. This is a sculpture by an African American artist by the name of, of Mita Warwick Fuller and it's called Ethiopia Awakening. And it's a sculpture, it's not a painting. And as we can see, it's a figure that is very much interested in the past, going back to that tumor poetry. And the past here is ancient Egypt. We can tell that from the, the headdress that this figure wear, wears. We can tell that in the kind of configurations of the gestures and the body. We can tell that in the wrapping of the body. It almost looks like it's a mummy. But the problem here is that the mummy, or it's not a problem, it's just an observation, is that the mummy is wrapped from the bottom up, but as we get to the top, it's almost as if the wrappings have come apart. It's almost as if that this mummy has awakened from a deep, deep sleep or from the dead. I love the way that Mita Warwick Fuller has the head twisting to the side. I love the way Mita Warwick Fuller has one hand to the heart and the other one extended Egyptian style. And the title of the work, Ethiopia Awakening, is, is, is in some ways very much close to the Langston Hughes image and very close to the Gene Tumor poet poem in the sense that for Nita Warwick Fuller, the idea is that African peoples have, a, have suddenly awakened from a deep, deep sleep circa 1923, that after years of, of repression, of discrimination, of, 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 of 
focusing on the past, that suddenly there is this new um, identity, there's this newness, there's this sense of, of, of finally opening your eyes and seeing light anew. And so I think Ethiopia Awakening by Nita Warwick Fuller and Langston Hughes by Vino Rice in very different ways kind of introduce us, um, kind of show us that, that by the time we get to 1923, 1925, artists are very much attuned to the idea of the now. Rick, we have some interesting <clears throat> comments and questions here in the chat. One uh, participant writes, I like the theme of resurrection um, in the Fuller sculpture and the swirl of blue activity around Hughes. So you have resurrection and activity against coming to life. And then another person wrote, uh, going by here rather quickly, another person wrote uh, that these images speak to the mental death that Negroes have awakened from. Then we have a question. What kind of exposure did this artwork have in the 1920s? How was it received? Well, um, in terms of the Vino Bryce, his works were exhibited uh, in Harlem, uh, in the library, uh, in the uh, early mid-20s, um, actually to a lot of controversial response. Not everybody understood exactly what he was doing. Uh, Mita Warwick Fuller's work, on the other hand, was much more, I mean, sculpture was a much more rarefied art form. And so her works weren't quite as, as visible as, interestingly, Vino Rice's works were. But it was also around this time that you had organizations like the Harmon Foundation who were dedicated to representing and displaying works by African-American artists. So soon and very soon, artists like Mita Woolworth Fuller and her cohorts, who we'll be seeing in a few minutes, had opportunities to have their work shown um, within the community, and not just in Harlem, but they had touring exhibitions that would be shown all over the United States with a focus on black communities. We have another interesting comment here. <clears throat> the downturned left hand of the Fuller sculpture seems to say, stop to the past. The rest of the image rises above it. Uh, that never, never occurred to me. See, I love how um, when people look at works, um, they kind of deal with them um, on their own terms. And as I often encourage my students, that, that, that of course there's a history behind art. At the same time, there's our initial encounter with the work. And, and those thoughts, those feelings are valid. We don't want to put them aside. Mm -hmm. We want to really acknowledge those. So I thank you for those comments. And here's another <clears throat> close observer. Neither look at the viewer. The woman looks over to the side while Hughes looks out past the edge of the painting. Where are they looking? Is it the future? Interesting connection. I love that. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, shall we move on? We've got a little over, we got about an hour or so. No problem. Yeah, I, I need to roll. <laughs> okay. Um, talking about young African-American artists during the New Negro Arts Movement, one of the most important was um, Aaron Douglas. Uh, Aaron Douglas was born in the Midwest, like Hughes for that example, for that matter. And uh, he comes uh, to New York in the mid 1920s. You're looking at a photograph of him on the right. And he interestingly links up with Vino Rice, this German artist. And he ends up working in the studio of Vino Rice. And they, and, 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 he, and Douglas is like a student of, of Vino Rice's. And it's as a result of being a student of Vino Rice's that he really comes into his own. And uh, I'm going to read a little quote that I don't have on the web for you, but I'm going to read it anyway. And, and this is a quote that um, Aaron Douglas has in a letter, and he's talking about going to the Brooklyn Museum um, and, and, that, and that Vino Rice encouraged him to objectify with paint and brush what he thought were the visual emanations that came into view with the sounds produced by the old black song makers. Now, what's interesting about that quote is that Aaron Douglas goes to the Brooklyn Museum to look at African art. But in the process of looking at African art, he begins to imagine music. And he begins to imagine not African music, but African American music. And on the left, you're looking at a mural that Aaron Douglas did in Chicago in the early 1930s. It no longer exists. It's been torn down. But if you look really close at that area to the far left, you see figures of people dancing, silhouettes of forms. And so Aaron Douglas was one of these young um, artists during the New Negro Arts Movement who fuses 
um, African art, who's thinking about music, who's thinking about poetry, and the results are very, very interesting and I think really powerful works, such as this painting, uh, which he does in a 19, um, let's say 1930-31 for Bennett College in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. And the painting or the mural is about Harriet Tubman, the famous 19th century um, woman who brings enslaved men and women and children from the South through the Underground Railroad to points north and to freedom. And so what Aaron Douglas does with this historical figure is that he creates this very modern looking painting. Um, notice that his palette is just this beautiful kind of world of greens and turquoises and teals and, and that you have silhouettes. He's not interested in giving you all the details that you find in academic painting, but he gives you the silhouette of leaves, of palm trees, of buildings, of ground, of people. Some of the people, um, like the figure in the middle, is ostensibly Harriet Tubman. She's breaking chains. Figures on the right show a nuclear family, a woman, a man, two children. I love the figure on the far right. He's kind of contemplating and looking up at those skyscrapers. If we look to the left, we see people who might be enslaved people. They're, they're holding burdens on their heads, or they might be people from, from, from Africa before slavery. So what Aaron Douglas has done in a very um, simplified, modernist way is he's given us this broad history about from slavery to freedom. And he's used Harriet Tubman as the centerpiece for the work. And then on top of all of that, because I know this question is going to come up, is that we have these amazing abstract elements that are on top of the composition, these circles that seem to, to narrow down or, or focus on the, the barrel of that cannon. And then we have that ray of light that's cutting from the upper left to the lower right that shows Harriet Tubman and the young um, gentleman kneeling with his, his, his hoe in hand. And, and, and so what Aaron Douglas has done is he's woven in a very kind of simplified form, in a very modernist form, the history of Black struggle and um, moving from slavery to freedom. Rick, I know you mentioned the abstract forms, but we've had a lot of comments in the chat about the circular forms that uh, are, right, are foregrounded in the painting. People are talking about these being uh, bullseyes or focusing uh, uh, attention, suggesting that this is the center of something, this is the moment. Uh, could you comment on those circular forms? Well, you know, this is a complicated story for Aaron Douglas. I mean, Aaron Douglas is not just a new Negro artist, but he's really a modernist. And he's reading a lot of philosophy during this time period. And he's very interested in um, nature and the world and um, the forces of nature. And so when we look at his work, we not only see history um, unfolding, but we see how light and how forces of nature in terms of energy are, are manifested visually. And I can't help but think that for him, focusing on the African-American experience, but fusing that African-American experience with these abstracted symbols is very important. And it speaks to the universal nature of the black experience, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We have some other interesting comments here, too. Um, one person writes, I like how it looks as though they are on top of a mountain, uh, and relates the, the person relates it back to the uh, Negro artist in the racial mountain. And then a very interesting comment, the leaves on the trees show that Harriet Tubman has traversed various climates, perhaps even time zones, from slavery to freedom. Really perceptive comments. Yeah, once you begin to get into these paintings, you begin to see a, a, an internal logic that just begs for us to kind of um, deconstruct it. Um, speaking of the Negro artist in the racial mountain, we have Langston Hughes again. And this is, of course, his very famous um, manifesto. And I think it was a manifesto. It was published in The Nation in 1926. And this is the key part of that, um, of that manifesto. We younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark-skinned selves without fear or shame. If white people are pleased, we are glad. 
If they are not, it doesn't matter. We know we are beautiful and ugly too. The Tom Tom cries and the Tom Tom laughs. If colored people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, their displeasure doesn't matter either. We build our temples for tomorrow, strong as we know how, and we stand on top of the mountain, free within ourselves. I mean, it's interesting, as somebody mentioned, how this piece by Hughes is visually referenced in the Aaron Douglas uh, uh, painting. And there's so many things in that, in that passage by Hughes. In particular, I would emphasize the fact, again, that we're talking about young artists and that we're talking about an emphasis on a kind of a physiognomy um, that is dark skin and therefore going against the kind of idealized kind of white beauty during that time period. And I would also focus you on the fact that Hughes seems to suggest that, that, um, that, that this work um, is for everyone. And yet, if people have, like it, fine. If not, that's all right, too. And I like the fact that he incorporates the spectrum of the human um, presentation, be it beautiful or be it ugly, be it um, a voice that cries or be it a voice that laughs. So in other words, he's interested in an art that is not going to just simply be a positive narrative, but one that will cover the gamut of emotions and one that is heartfelt and that is freely um, expressed and freely voiced on top of this metaphorical mountain. We have a comment here. A person notes that Jim Crow was still ruling the roost. And if you think about this in, in the context of Jim Crow, this is a remarkably confident and optimistic statement to be making at a, at a very dark time for African Americans in our history. And that's why I love the art of young people, because they have the, the chutzpah. They have the, 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 the ability to just kind of cut through the past and tradition and, and legislation to say what they think and what they feel. And that's really what Hughes is doing in this piece. Okay, well, shall we move ahead? Yeah. Um, the other thing that I talk about in the uh, section that I asked you to read is the kind of range of what might constitute an image of the new Negro. And I thought it would be fun to look at these two photographs to kind of underscore that, that variety, that complexity. I always start with the image on the right because I really love it so much. The photograph is by a black photographer working out of Columbia, South Carolina. His name is um, Richard um, um, Roberts. And this is a portrait that he, that he does of his son. And um, it's interesting that Richard Roberts is a photographer and that he represents his son with his tools of trade, the camera. That's an old time camera that, that um, the son is Cornelius is, is, um, is, is leaning against. And you can see the viewfinder on the left. And um, actually what the young man is holding is one of those old negatives that you put in the camera to, to capture the image ultimately. I like the fact that, that Cornelius is um, dressed in a suit, uh, has a pen in his pocket. Um, is, he's like a very young and ready young man for the world. He looks directly at, at, at us, um, the camera that's taking his picture with a dedication, with a focus, with not laughing and grinning, but with a seriousness and, 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 and sense of purpose. And so that's one way that one African-American artist represents this newness. But if we look at the image on the left, we're getting something very different. And one of the things that I argue in my text and that I would suggest to you today, that in order for us to talk about the new Negro, we have to know something about, quote unquote, the old Negro. And Doris Ullman, a white photographer working in New York in the 1920s, seems to have picked up on this. And here she is living in kind of the most urbane situation in the United States circa 1920s. But for her subject matter, she goes to South Carolina. She um, does all of these amazing, beautiful, evocative pictures of open air baptisms, of people picking cotton, of very, very interesting images of quote unquote, um, the old Negro. And if you look at this picture, one, I love the way she composes her, her picture so that this, this baptism in the, in the water is like maybe one 
um, one third of the composition. And that the rest of the composition is just this incredible sky, um, pieces of, 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 of trees and, and foliage kind of hanging. Um, it's a very, and we see the reflections of these people in the water. And so I would argue that, that, that all of these images really constitute a mode of thinking about the new Negro, um, even if it means a kind of a retroactive reflection backwards, which is what Gene Toomer actually does uh, in his poem as well. Rick, I think the, the Roberts photo is particularly useful because it shows that in this country, the new Negro movement wasn't restricted just to Harlem and the cities of the North, that this new uh, self-awareness and self-consciousness even reached into the South. And you usually don't associate the South with the Harlem Renaissance or the new Negro movement. I mean, this brings us juxtaposed interestingly with the comment about Jim Crow a minute ago. I mean, this is assertion of a new consciousness in the face of Jim Crow in the South. Yes, another interesting sidebar to the Richard Roberts, he was from Columbia, South Carolina. And um, according to the historical literature, um, the black community uh, in Columbia in the 1920s was referred to as Little Harlem. Oh. And, and, and so there really is this kind of national and international kind of sense of, of black um, artistry that's operating during this time period. Um, even if in a place like Columbia, you know, we have this kind of small world that doesn't seem necessarily connected to urbanity and, and what have you. But, but, but this piece is a very important image, as is the Doris Ullman. Mm -hmm. A quick technical question here. Would the old time negative invert the colors of the subject the way contemporary negatives would? Uh, yes. And um, so um, one always has to, um, you know, um, kind of maneuver and manipulate those negatives. And sometimes photographers will flip the, 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 the negatives um, um, just as an artistic statement. Mm -hmm. um, the, the early technologies are, are, that's a whole nother sidebar that unfortunately I can't get into. Right, we but, don't have uh, time. But, but it's, very, it's a very rich uh, field of, of study. Okay, and another question about reception. What was the level of reception of the work from this era among the non-African American community? How did whites respond to this? Or did they even see it? Well, Doris Ullman is oh, uh, she's right. That's right. Manhattanite, and she is connected to the Ethical Society at Columbia University. She is very much um, an elite, and um, the new Negro arts movement was not just for African Americans. Everybody, blacks and whites, Americans and Europeans, were fascinated with black culture, and so that's kind of the modus operandi for us this evening that what we're talking about is a phenomena that is um, very much rooted in um, African-American communities among African-American artists, but its reverberations go beyond that community to an international artistic statement. Mm -hmm. We have another interesting comment here. Both images reflect the elements that were important to the new Negro movement, church values, and the emergence of the Negro businessman, the emergence of the Negro middle class. Well, I'm so glad that was brought up. If one goes to that very famous book, The New Negro, that was published in 1925, believe it or not, their focus in one of their chapters is on Durham, North Carolina, which is viewed as the, the kind of mecca of black business because of the black insurance companies and, and what have you. So black businesses are also prominently a part of the, the landscape uh, during this time period. Mm -hmm. And we'll see that in the Van Der Zee photos later on. Exactly. Um, just to do more contrast and comparison, two painters uh, from this time period, two African-American artists. Uh, on the uh, left is uh, William Henry Johnson, uh, a painting that he did um, shortly after returning from several years living in Paris. Uh, I like this painting because it's, it's, um, very, it shows a very modern way of thinking about portraiture. Here the body is distorted, the, the head is elongated, the colors are very bold and, 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 and big, and the clothing is kind of pushed to extremes. And, and it shows the kind of the new Negro is kind of this bohemian, this avant-garde, um, 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 very in-your-face kind of uh, radical um, artist. In contrast, we have this portrait by uh, Laura Wheeler Waring on the right, um, entitled Anna Washington Derry. 
Um, Anna Washington Derry was a friend of um, of the Waring. Um, Anna Washington Derry was a friend of the Waring family, and um, it, and and Waring shows her as a matron of the family, um, a, a pillar of her community. Um, wedding ring on one hand, a beautiful, elegant outfit. I love the way that her name uh, is done almost as if it's chiseled um, out of uh, out of marble, a uh, Greco-Roman style, um, to the left of her head. And so I show you these as, as two paintings done more or less around the same time, the late 20s, and that show you how um, artists, African-American artists, you know, really look at a range of ways of representing uh, the new Negro. Um, Richard, you mentioned Van Der Zee earlier, and um, one would be, um, one, would, one has to acknowledge his important uh, work. Um, there was a question earlier about black businesses, and, and one of the things I like about Van Der Zee is that Van Der Zee, the, the photographer um, here that I'm showing you, both his portrait, his self-portrait on the right, and a photograph he, that he's done on the left, Van Der Zee um, would be what you might consider a popular artist. And what I mean by being a popular artist is that he, he didn't view himself in the same terms as the art that, that I just showed you. He viewed himself as a businessman whose medium, whose, whose tool of the trade was the camera. And he was based in Harlem and his, his, his clientele were the everyday, ordinary, average African-Americans in Harlem. And we see that in the image on the left we see this couple, um, a very dapper couple in their raccoon coats. Um, he is sitting in the Cadillac. She is standing outside of it. And the Cadillac is, oh, that's an amazing um, a vehicle. And then we see the, uh, the, the, the brownstones behind them. And, and the piece is very much a statement about beauty, about style, about accomplishment. But I would also go back to what I said at the beginning of our conversation, that while this photograph uh, is, is, is quite extraordinary in its composition, one should be careful in assuming that what we see is exactly what was. In other words, Van Der Zee had, a, had an imagination and had the ability to compose and to create scenes that would fit a particular mindset. And the mindset of the new Negro was that we have arrived and that Harlem is the Mecca and that this is a place that is sparkling and wonderful, despite the fact that in 1932, we are experiencing the depths of the Great Depression. And so art in this way becomes an opportunity to make a larger, more um, impressionistic statement than is necessarily part of reality. Um, just as a sidebar, the portrait by Van Der Zee I love too. The way the cat sits in the chair and he stands to the side of, of the cat. It's, it's, it's a little kind of um, um, almost um, a palimpsest that he sets up for us that, 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 that's kind of poetic and funny uh, at the same time. Um, I want to move a little bit now to um, another element of the New Negro Arts Movement, and that is the connections between the arts and performance. And I'm going to quote this wonderful passage from Carl Van Vechten, um, who was a, a, um, a white gentleman living in New York City, who in many respects was one of the major kind of promoters of African-American artists during this time period. And this is um, his description of Bessie Smith, a, a performance that he sees uh, in Newark, New Jersey. Her face was beautiful with the rip, rich, ripe beauty of Southern darkness, a deep bronze matching the bronze of her bare arms, walking slowly to the footlights, to the accompaniment of the wailing muted brasses, the monotonous African pounding of the drums, the dromedary glide of the pianist's fingers over the responsive keys. She began her strange rhythmic rites in a voice full of shouting and moaning and praying and suffering. A wild, rough Ethiopian voice, harsh and volcanic, but seductive and sensuous too, released between rouged lips and the whitest of teeth. Now you can tell in that, in that reading that, and, and in, that, in that statement that, that Vendectin 
um, is very much, he, he's theatrical in his own right. And that he extrapolates from this woman, Bessie Smith, who we're looking at on the left, all sorts of fantasies, fantasies of Africa, fantasies of, of, of the primitive, fantasies of, of all sorts of things. And, and yet he is totally enamored with this incredible performing artist. And I would argue that this is a moment when black artists, particularly blues singers and jazz musicians, really do rule the day from Duke Ellington to Louis Armstrong to Bessie Smith to Josephine Baker. And just to give you a sense of that, that, that energy, we see this advertisement on the right from the Chicago Defender for a blues called Black Hand Blues. And it's showing um, images of the blues singer, Memphis Julia Davis. And we see this kind of cartoony representation of what her Black Hand Blues song is all about. So this is a moment when performing artists really do are the stars of the moment, very much like this moment in, in many respects. And their, their songs and their performances become the subject of, of, of art. Rick, if we could, if I could just interrupt for a second. I, I, we have a question, a very interesting question about the Van Beck, um, and the Van Der Zee um, uh, images. Was he in any way fetishizing uh, these these images, or was he? Is this pure admiration? Is there any irony involved in the presentation here? You know, knowing Van Der Zee as a businessman, as someone who caters to his clients, I would have to say no, that there is no irony in his work, that what he is doing is celebrating his subjects to the hilt, that he is really making them look fabulous. And they are being happy being fabulous in their raccoon coats, in their Cadillacs, in the city, looking good, despite the fact that he might be, uh, um, the guy might be a lowly porter, the lady might be um, a, a maid um, in somebody's home. But given the opportunity to have their pictures taken and given the opportunity to create an image for themselves, they can be anything they want to be. And Van Der Zee helps them in that in that magic. Okay, well that that's that's illuminating and insightful. And I just realized that I just asked the wrong question. Oh, uh, hold on. sorry. The, no, the, no, I, I asked the I asked the right question, but not the wrong person. Actually, the question is about Carl Van Vechten, and the question's still the same: Is Van Vechten fetishizing um, here, or is he truly admiring? And the person writes here that uh, Van Vechten uh, he he is a, a, a example 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 of <clears throat> the Columbus effect, discovering something. That's an interesting <laughs> well, way I agree. It. I agree. So, let me finally ask the right question. Is Van Beck fetishizing or is he admiring? Well, how about both? <laughs> <laughs> how about um, an answer that says he truly thought Bessie Smith was an extraordinary artist and in some ways he zooms in on her in a way that isolates aspects of her persona and that in that isolation, in the focusing on her arms, on her body, on her voice, on his own fantasies, there is a kind of a psycho analytic thing that has nothing to do with her and has a lot to do with him. And yet he can also admire her. And this is a part of the new Negro arts movement that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. The this thing that we call primitivism, which is a kind of an attitude where people look at African Americans and automatically think that these people are, are absolutely connected to Africa and that with their connection to Africa are certain um, stereotypes that seem to proliferate. Stereotypes that for, for the average um, kind of um, European or white American, there is on one hand a sense of revulsion, and on the other hand, a sense of fascination and obsession and desire for. And so I think that's what you are getting in Carl Van Vechten's um, passage here. Okay, good. Well, shall we move on then? Yes. And you get the same thing, I think, in this quote, which I'm not going to read in its entirety. I'll let you look at it on your own. But it's by a Frenchman, and he is basically fantasizing and thinking about um, jazz, thinking about African-American musicians, um, um, vibing off of all of the parts of the Black diaspora, um, Africa, um, the Caribbean, uh, the Black South, 
um, Harlem. Um, so this is, you know, kind of the, the mode that we were just kind of talking about in terms of Carbon Becton. And I also wanted you to think about this idea in relationship to this painting, because this painting is a painting not of Harlem, although it's often used on the covers of books that have to do with the Harlem Renaissance, but it was actually painted in Paris. The artist is Archibald Motley. He was born in Chicago, and he gets a grant to go to Paris in the late 1920s. And it's while he's in Paris that he discovers this, this black world of folks from, from the South, from, from Harlem, you're basically jazz musicians, or people who were black soldiers who decided to stay in France. Um, he's also meeting folks from the Caribbean. He's meeting folks from Africa, those, those, those folks who were colonial citizens who found their way to France. And in this painting, Blues, he decides to put them all in there, um, but under the umbrella of this African-American musical form known as the blues. But the way that he represents it is, is quite sophisticated. I love how this painting is so dense. We see all these wonderful figures. If you move from one corner to another corner, you see bodies, you see heads, you see arms. I love in the lower right-hand corner, you see a foot floating out of nowhere. Um, I love the woman in the middle with her cigarette and the smoke kind of rising. I love the way we see the musical instruments almost um, invading the space of the dancers. And so Archibald Motley has really successfully encapsulated how performance and how music and how jazz and blues and dancing are in one with, with the artistic expression of the new Negro. You also have here, Rick, the fact <clears throat> that um, you can't tell if all of the people in that painting are, are black. I mean, the woman in the red dress there toward the right, she has um, her legs look white, and the, the, the disembodied foot you mentioned in the lower right-hand corner is white. So that, that's further indication that this painting is not probably about Harlem. I mean, this is um, interracial um, uh, dancing that took place in Europe, in Paris, where, where people found a sense of liberation. Well, well, my response is twofold. One is, um, yes, that, that, that um, the Paris cabaret scene was a multiracial scene, that you find not just people from um, the black diaspora, but you see Americans and Europeans and all sorts of people who congregate at these clubs because African-American music was the end thing. My other answer to that comment is that African-Americans are a rainbow that we find um, very, very um, dark-skinned um, peoples of African descent, and we find very, very fair-skinned peoples of African descent. And I noticed in one of the uh, questions um, about this painting that Motley really does give us a rainbow uh, in this composition, with an emphasis on our, our women being more kind of fair-skinned and our men being uh, darker-skinned. Um, but nonetheless, we have this, this, this spectrum um, on um, race, which is, I think, kind of a subtle message that, that Motley is, is putting across uh, as represented in his figures. Well, that, that may be a good place for us to ask one of the questions in the form. How has art served as a form of resistance for the African-American community? Is there any, if this picture was displayed in the United States, is there any political content, any resistance content that, that you could talk about in this painting? Well, I would say that for Motley, the resistance here is everybody getting together, regardless of race, um, phenotype, and having a good time. And that was a radical statement. That was a political statement in the 1920s, given segregation, given the whole politics of white people being in one part of the world and black people being in another part of the world. So when Motley creates a painting called Blues that has everybody under the rainbow all dancing cheek to cheek, jowl to jowl to black music, that is a radical and ultimately political statement. Oh, good. Well, shall we move on then? Yeah. And one of the challenges, again, of this primitive idea that we talked about earlier, this fascination with black people which is kind of celebratory. And on the other hand, the kind of what I would call the stereotyping of black people uh, is, is just the fact that these things coexist. And I think a good example of that 
would be seen in the persona and in the representations of Josephine Baker. Many of you know she was born in St. Louis and uh, she worked the, the Chitlin circuit as they call it and she was part of, uh, of the, uh, the vaudeville shows and in the mid-20s she makes it to New York and she um, becomes a part of a traveling show called La Revue Negre and being a part of that show brings her to Paris and it's in Paris that the skinny 18-year-old African-American woman literally revolutionizes fashion, um, turns the world upside down with her incredible dancing, with her beauty, with her provocation um, of, of wearing, often dancing nude. And we see in these two pictures, again, two extremes. On one hand, a very elegant nude um, uh, done of her, um, with I love the slick hair and the, the spit curl on the side of her face. And then the other image, which is very, um, very racist, I would say, that shows her almost as an ape uh, behind a cage, behind bars. But I would stress to, to our, 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 our class members tonight that Josephine Baker was aware of all of these representations of herself, and she was willing to have this spectrum of the ugly and the beautiful juxtaposed um, under her under her name um, and in her image. Because for young modern artists, they, they didn't just want to show a pretty picture, they wanted to show the gamut. And they wanted to show the problematic as well as the celebratory. And I think you see that in her images. Um, I want to talk about Africa fairly briefly because we got to we, we, I see our time, we're really ticking. And I just want to mention that for many artists during the New Negro Arts Movement, um, Africa becomes a vehicle for modernism. Here we see um, Charles Dawson doing a, an advertisement for a hair straightener of no regrets, where he uses Madagascar, a kind of an alliteration of the, uh, of the, the, the country Madagascar as the title of this uh, hair straightener. We see the sphinxes on either side and these gentlemen in the lower right hand corner of the ad with their slicked hair. And we also see this at work uh, in Covarrubias's cartoon on the right. Um, this is a cartoon where we see a, a dapper Harlem couple looking at a piece of African sculpture. And the idea here is that the sculpture is a mirror to the couple. And so, but the couple don't see how connected to Africa that they are as represented in the sculpture. So Covarrubias here is kind of playing with that primitive idea. But Covarrubias also um, is a lover of jazz and blues, and we see that in this amazing painting on the left, Rhapsody in Blue um, from 1927. Covarrubias was Mexican. He comes to New York in the mid-1920s, and he is a part of this scene like Ben Beckton, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, et cetera. I want to kind of move on because I see our time is really ticking and I want to talk about the 30s because the 30s, I would argue, is an extension of the 1920s, but in a slightly different way. And I think you see that in this juxtaposition, Richmond Barté's African dancer on the left and Sergeant Johnson's Negro woman on the right, both done in 1933, but very different. One could say that Barté's work being more, ide more, being more naturalistic, more uh, kind of anatomically um, precise, um, seems to play on the kind of stereotype of the African dancer in a way that, that the Sergeant Johnson is doing something very different. The Sergeant Johnson has a, has a black woman, but it's done very stylized, um, almost as if it's a piece of, of pre-Columbian sculpture. And my argument would be that when we move from the 20s to the 30s, in some ways we move from a renaissance to a, um, to a, a reconstruction, a, a, a rehabilitation, a rethinking of, 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 of the ideas that were espoused to something more political, more, um, more social, and given the depths of the Great Depression that people were living in, something that really t attunes themselves to the political realities and the economic realities of the times. And I, I think that, 
if I, okay, just I'm sorry to interrupt, but we have some comments that I don't want to let slip by. Sure. If we could go back to the Josephine Baker <clears throat> uh, images for a moment. Uh, we have an interesting comment here. I, I don't see her, the participant writes, as a zoo animal. Rather, I saw the gray bars as a political statement suggesting perhaps that her performance for a largely for her performances for a largely white audience are another form of servitude and lack of freedom. There's that contrast between the apparent freedom of her movement and the part and partial nudity and the bars. Interesting perspective on that. It is. It is. Yeah. One could one could one could do that um, with it. Um, but I would say that you got to look at that figure. And to me, that figure um, is um, too simian for um, for comfort, in my opinion. But 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 still, it's a powerful piece of work. And then if we could go on to the Corubius uh, image. Yes. Okay. Because, uh, we have some comments on that. Um, is the woman on the left of the painting bored? Um, <laughs> I love the expression of the other one watching. It's very funny. Uh, so we have a number of people wondering about the woman on the on the left. Uh, <laughs> She seems to be unimpressed by the whole thing. You want to comment on on that? Well, you know, I think I think our class, because you know, we put so much emphasis on those musicians on the right, on this very elegant woman in her teal dress in the middle. We forget the other folks, and when we look at those folks, there's this kind of um, resignation that here we go again. Um, the couple in the the couples in the back seem to be enjoying themselves. But what I like about this painting is that we do get this kind of gamut of emotions and feelings. And maybe that's what the blues is about. Maybe the blues is not just about exhilaration. Maybe the blues is about being in the doldrums sometimes as well. And in that way, Covarrubias has really nailed, you know, that aesthetic out of the Black experience. Mm -hmm. And then if we could move on to the next set of images. Uh, here we have a comment. Uh, Johnson's work reminds me of indigenous American art. Uh, could be Mayan. And there is a, do you think there is a certain uh, um, Mayan quality to that uh, image on the right? That viewer is very perceptive. Um, what I didn't mention about Sergeant Johnson is that he is working out of San Francisco. And I would argue that being based on the West Coast exposes Sergeant Johnson to a range of, of art forms, not just African art, or not just European art, but um, Latino art, art from uh, Mexico, um, Native American art forms. He's also working in ceramic. So, so yes, I think that this is a piece that is in some ways much more um, hybrid in terms of its, its, its sources of inspiration than perhaps the, uh, the bar tech. Okay, and then we have another, uh, well, about the bar, if we could go back to that for a yeah. moment. Uh, another person writes, the image on, on the right, on the left, the uh, Barte image, uh, reminds the person a bit of Donatello's David. See, this is very good. Um, I like this class because one of the theories about this painting, the sculpture on the left, is, and I noticed that people are mentioning androgyny, yep. and, and I wonder whether Barte is working from a male model in, in this piece on the left, and that um, he has conveniently dropped some breasts on the figure. I mean, we know that, 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 that physiognomy covers the gamut uh, in, in terms of gender and, and what have you, but, th but th this figure does seem in some ways to be um, both male and, 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 and female. And, in, and also it could be hearkening back to a Renaissance uh, and yet incorporating Africa into the Renaissance as, as represented in the form itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, at one point, a uh, uh, participant noted that we definitely don't have a woman's hips <laughs> on the uh, figure to the left. I agree. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to just move ahead a bit to uh, Motley again. Motley's one of my favorite painters, and we saw his blues before. When he comes back to Chicago and settles down in the, on the south side, he embarks on a series of really exciting paintings that really touch on what's happening in the black community at that moment of the Great Depression. Not that we're looking at poverty all the time, but we're certainly looking at kind of everyday life. People picnicking, here we have a couple under a tree, people um, next to wine and, and grapes and fruit and, and what have you. 
So Motley really is, is, is connected to the community by the time he gets back to Chicago and is trying to, to again, connect his work to the lives and experiences of everyday people. Um, I have a quote here um, from Zora Neale Hurston that um, um, I'll, I'll summarize it for you and then you can go back and read it. She's describing a home that she's seeing in 1932 in Mobile. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's an African-American home that is, um, that is layered with stuff, a mohair um, overstuffed living room suite, a mahogany bed, a Victrola, the walls are papered with newspaper, the Mobile Register, their calendars, their wall pockets, their lace doilies, their mantle shelves are covered with lace and bows, and there's advertisements with a Waterman fountain pen and the Treaty of Versailles. And she says, yes, it was grotesque, but it indicated the desire for beauty. And decorating a decoration, as in the case of a doily on a gaudy wall pocket, did not seem out of place to the hostess. The feeling back of such an act, this, this, this in, the environment that I just described to you and that she describes to us, is that there can never be enough beauty, let alone too much. We have our standards of art and thus we are all interested parties and so unfit to pass judgment upon the art concepts of others. And I like this quote from Hurston because not only does she, I think, describe a, a, a kind of a, a, an accumulative um, collage aesthetic that will come to fruition perhaps in the work of somebody like Romy Bearden, but she's also underscoring the value of everyday ordinary folks and their artistic expression having just as much importance and just as much validity as an academic artist or painter or poet or musician. And so one of the characteristics of the 30s is the shift to the popular, to the folk, to the everyday, to, to, to people who, who not only are the subjects of art during that time period, but in some ways the creators of works themselves. Rick, we have a really, Rick, if I can interrupt, I'm sorry. We have a really good question here that I want to get in before we wrap things up. Uh, the question is this. Is a black person able to create art without notions of Eurocentrism? Are some blacks so beholden to the colonizer mind they cannot separate the authenticity of their creativity and culture from the values and mores of their oppressors? So I guess this question is getting at questions of influence. To what extent do you see um, Euro European values, European influences uh, shaping and informing uh, African-American art of this period? Well, the first thing I would say to answer that question is that um, art that has been produced uh, in the modern era, and I'm really, when I say the modern era, I'm going um, back to the 18th century on, that art produced from the 18th century on is art that is informed by everything that it comes in contact with, or everything that the artists come in contact with. So we have artists, you know, in India who have seen um, academic painting. We see artists in Paris who have been informed by African sculpture. We see um, artists from the pre-Columbian, or, or rather Mexican artists, who are looking at folk art, and they're also looking at Cubism. So my point here is that that, that, that to answer that question, I would first of all have to say that, that in the modern era, the world is everybody's source of information and inspiration. And that you have to consciously decide on what your sources are going to be um, to kind of move in a particular direction if you choose to do that. And we have instances during this time period, in particular during the Harlem Renaissance, where artists are choosing to have a particular ethnic, cultural um, kind of um, aspect to what they do. But often that's overlaid with the other influences and sources of inspiration and information that they get um, either consciously or subliminally. So, so it's a hard question to answer, but I would just urge the, the, the questioner to, to know that, that artists have the world at their disposal and they often use that world in all sorts of interesting ways, yeah, black to, artists and white artists. Yeah, to illustrate your point, I mean, Picasso was very much interested by, int influenced by African art. I mean, just look at Mademoiselle d'Avignon and his use of African masks. Yes, 
Yeah. And uh, let's see, uh, we have another comment here. Uh, <clears throat> slavery and the following oppression has been quite effective in causing uh, people of African uh, descent to disclaim and deny their ethnic identity. Well, I think here we're seeing the new Negro movement is quite the opposite of that. It is an assertion of ethnic identity, wouldn't you and, say? And that was the, the major kind of contribution of the new Negro arts movement, that one could argue that prior to this point, um, there was anxiety around one's identity, um, one's black identity. Mm -hmm. And yet artists like Hughes and Aaron Douglas and Zora Neale Hurston and Gene Toomer, all of a sudden privilege um, the black body and celebrate um, black folk culture and the blues. And so this is a moment that is a breakout moment. Um, and that it's a moment that kind of gets re reverberated when we move to the 1960s and 1970s with the black arts movement. Um, and so we find these kind of epics and these kind of um, shifts in tastes and sensibilities. But the 20s and 30s was definitely a, a moment that, that refocuses on, on the Black um, experience and celebrates it as such. Okay, I think you just answered this question. <clears throat> How can I help my students understand that during these time, during these periods, African Americans expressed themselves in a positive way, but were also treated as second class citizens? Um, uh, let's see, some of the art writing does not do not show this. So what we, what I think we could say here to, to the students is that uh, yes, this is a dark time in African American history, but the the assertion of art and the assertion of optimism and confidence here is in the face of that, despite all that, and it is as you say, sort of maybe the the seeds of things that we see later on coming to fruition with the Black Arts Movement and so forth in the 1960s. And there's also an assumption in that question that, you know, if life is tough, people don't move on. Mm -hmm. that, that if life is tough, people just give up. And I would say just the opposite, that when life is tough, people find a way to make their lives meaningful. They find a way to make their lives rich. They find a way to make their lives beautiful. In the depths of, of, of violence and segregation and, and discrimination and belittlement, you know, we find these artists doing extraordinary things that, that to me say African Americans matter and our culture is something that's vital. And one day, hopefully this art or rather the politics and the social life will match the artistry and the brilliance of, of, what, of what these artists can create. Okay, shall we move on then? Some really great questions here. I know, and, and the challenge is that we've got so many more images and not enough time. Well, that's okay. So. We, I don't think anybody's going to leave if we go, uh, go over our 830 limit, so don't rush. Okay, well, um, talking about the 30s and talking about um, hard times and um, tough times, I wanted to show this painting by Palmer Hayden um, called Midsummer Night in Harlem, and it's a very interesting painting. Uh, it shows people sitting out um, on, in Harlem um, on porch stoops, hanging out of windows, uh, cars driving by, um, the moon hovering in the sky. I mean, I, I remember there was a question earlier about tongue in cheek, about work that might be ironic. And I would argue that this is probably a good example of an African-American artist being ironic. When he says this is Midsummer Night in Harlem, I think this is not to be taken straight. I think this is a work that speaks to a kind of the, the challenges, the absurdities of, of, of life in the inner city uh, circa 1936. Um, it's interesting that this painting was done a year after the riots um, in Harlem in 1935. And so this is how an artist might ironically represent the community in a way that speaks to poverty, that speaks to violence, um, that speaks to um, um, difference um, in terms of, of economic and, and equity uh, in, in, in New York City. And I like the fact that the moon is hovering in the upper left-hand corner. And, and as anybody knows, full moons often create a moment of madness and, and, and craziness in the world. And this is an old, story that goes back thousands and thousands of years. I think Palmer Hayden is playing with that idea. Let me also add this, that when we look at these figures, they're a little stereotypic. And it's almost as if Palmer Hayden is buying into um, the stereotype. But I would argue again that 
he's dealing with irony here and, and that his employment of the stereotype is strategic. And, and, and again, it underscores, um, again, the 1930s is a very different moment than the 1920s. And it speaks to, again, this kind of disassociation that, that, that the 30s reaps on black people um, um, during this time period because of the depression. And again, a sense of inequity. We have a report here from someone on the ground in Harlem right now on 125th Street, and she asserts that it doesn't look like that anymore. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> we have another interesting comment here. Uh, participant writes, I love how your eye is drawn toward the church. Lots of stuff to look at in this painting, a blending of the new and the traditional. Yes. Interesting comment. Yes, yes, yes. Um, speaking of kind of the 30s as this kind of interesting moment, here we have on the right a, a, a photograph of a steel mill worker, and on the left we have a cover of a book called The Negro Wage Earner, it was done around 1930. And, and the, the, the big issue during this time period um, is labor, is work. And remember that during the depths of the Great Depression, um, people were unemployed. And it took the federal government to create the Works Progress Administration to put people to work. And so um, not only do we have African Americans as a part of the workforce, but we have artists like James Wells doing the cover of this book that explores this idea of black labor. <laughs> and what I like about um, the spine of the book, if you look really closely at the spine, um, where it says Negro Wage Earner, Green and Woodson, um, there's a picture of a man and he is a waiter and he's holding a tray and the tray has on it skyscrapers. And as you can see, he's straddling skyscrapers, but he's also straddling a pyramid. And so here, James Wells has fused antiquity, modernity, menial labor, um, the city, in a very, very interesting melange of images that I think is quite sophisticated. Mm -hmm. um, politics, again, is really rears its head during this time period. And again, irony. And what better way to explore irony than to call this scene on the left lovers? This is definitely not lovers. This is violence perpetrated against a black woman by a Klansman. And Ernest Critchlow says, you know, in his title, irony, that, that, that some people might consider this, you know, um, business as usual, but, but no, this is horrible. And we see her, her resistance with her arms pushing and pushing against them. And those of you who know the 30s know that this was the moment of the Scottsboro trials, an incident where a group of young black men were, um, were arrested. Um, they were riding the rails uh, and arrested for, um, for, for raping two white women. And it became a major cause celeb. And so on the right, you're looking at a broadside with poetry by Langston Hughes and artworks by Princess Taylor, a white artist. So, so we see that, that African-American artist, Ernest Critchlow, white artist, Prentice Taylor, a lot of artists are looking at the black experience during this time period through political, social eyes. And this addresses further the question in the form about uh, uh, art serving as a form of resistance for African Americans. Absolutely. And we see this in the, in the prints, both of these pieces. Mm -hmm. And um, African American art as um, commemorative. Uh, this uh, sculpture on the right is called Lift Every Voice and Sing the Harp. The artist is Augustus Savage. It was done in 1939, and those of you who know that title, Lift Every Voice and Sing, know that that is the Negro National Anthem that was written around 1900 by James Weldon Johnson. And James Weldon Johnson dies in 1938. And so, Zora, rather, uh, Augusta Savage, um, and I, I, I almost made a mistake and called her Zora Neale Hurston because all of these people are from Florida, Savage, um, James Weldon Johnson, um, Hurston, but, but, but Savage decides to do this homage to, to, to James Weldon Johnson. And she does it in this very fantastic way, showing this kind of chorus of singers who um, form the, 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 the kind of strings of the harp. And, and the major part of the harp is a huge hand. And then we have at the very front of the sculpture, this kneeling figure holding musical notes in his hand. So 
So Savage is being very um, kind of um, um, symbolic in this sculpture. And I wish I had an actual photograph of a person standing alongside it, but a human being would probably come up to the shoulders of that kneeling figure. This is a very, very large sculpture. Tragically, it doesn't exist anymore. It was shown at the World's Fair in 1940. And, um, and because it was made of plaster, and because Augusta Savage didn't have a lot of money for storage, the piece ultimately and tragically was destroyed. But fortunately, we have this great photograph of it, by the way, taken by Carl Van Becken. Rick, how is this received? I think, I think today, I think most people would, would say that this is a magnificent work of art. Uh, how was it received in 1940? Well, this was a part of a big display of art at the World's Fair. And um, I, to be honest with you, I think the reactions to this work were mixed. Uh, people in the 1940s weren't always open and accepting of images of Black people that showed African physiognomy. Um, and here, Augustus Savage shows us, you know, people who were undeniably of African descent. Um, Augusta Savage was a real radical in her own way. She ran a, an art school in Harlem that catered to the people, the everyday ordinary people. And if anyone does research on Savage, you'll find that the commentaries on her were somewhat critical. And I think a lot of this also has to do with sexism, that she was a very outspoken woman. She um, didn't kowtow to people. And she was very politically minded. And all of that combined, along with her imagery, kind of made her work um, something that hasn't been appreciated until more recent times. Mm -hmm. And quickly, Rick, what happened to the sculpture on the left? Do we know if that still exists? Now, that's a good question. I believe the sculpture might still be extant. In other words, it still exists somewhere. Um, she was, um, she was, because of her lifestyle, because of her resources or lack of resources, her works pretty much were scattered to the wind. And it's been very difficult to kind of reassemble um, her, her work. Um, I know that the work on the left reminds me of something that I saw in a private collection uh, in New York, uh, but, um, but um, I, I, I can't verify that for certain. But she was a really, really talented sculptor who unfortunately uh, we have photographic records of and, um, and um, also some existing works of, and much more needs to be done about her. Okay. Yeah. Um, talking a little bit more about this diaspora idea, I wanted to show these two images on the left, a uh, photograph by Walker Evans called Havana Citizen from 1933, um, actually photographed in Havana, Cuba. And on the right, a gouache drawing by um, Edward Burra, a British artist, um, simply called Harlem from 1934. Um, one of the reasons why I like these two images is that the figures, the primary figures in both pieces are almost identical in their, comp their pose. They kind of contraposto pose, the kind of very cool fellow on the right wearing a straw hat, a Panama, I mean a white suit on the left, you know, wearing a smaller hat, but, and one being Harlem, one being Havana, but in many ways, speaking to this kind of diaspora black world with an emphasis on the everyday ordinary person, um, in particular, African Americans or peoples of African descent. Um, also to talk about diaspora, I wanted to show you this painting by Lois Maylou Jones. Lois uh, is, um, is um, uh, was a very um, upright Bostonian, black Bostonian woman who taught at Howard for many years. She goes to France at the end of the 30s and breaks out of her more conservative mode of painting to create a work like this, simply called Le Fetiche. We had that question earlier about um, does uh, Carl Van Vechten fetishize Bessie Smith? And here I would say that uh, Lois Maylou Jones uses this term Le Fetiche in a very kind of um, specific way to look at these masks that she sees in African gal art galleries in Paris and figures, and to kind of in many ways express her own ambivalence, her own questioning and wondering about Africa and her relationship to Africa, um, not only as an African-American, 
but as um, someone in France who was engaging with peoples of African descent uh, in, in, in the city of Lights, Paris. Um, a very, very interesting painting that um, is a kind of rich for, for interpretation. I, I also want to um, kind of move towards the end now and talk about a couple of moments in the 30s, um, one moment being um, the important uh, figure of Joe Lewis, um, the world heavyweight boxing champion. And you're, on the left, you're looking at a painting of his uh, entitled The Brown Bomber, which shows one of his famous fights. And he's hovering over um, the, um, the fighter, in this case, Max Schmeling. And, and um, those of you who know your boxing history know that, that Lewis was this young African-American who was born in Birmingham, who grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and was viewed as this very important fighter who is fighting this German fighter who represents the Nazis of during the late 1930s, symbolically, not, not a real Nazi, but because he's German, we had this kind of national face-off between Lewis and, and Schmeling. But the irony here is that the African-American uh, fighter, Joe Lewis, um, represents um, the black community as well as America. And so he had a lot of symbolic um, um, of, of capital, if you will, um, so much so that, that he's depicted in paintings such as the one on the left, as well as he's in advertisements like this hair pomade um, advertisement um, on the right. And so, and so figures like this take on this kind of social symbolic dimension uh, quite, um, quite significantly. Um, I, I want to end with, however, Zora Neale Hurston. And I want you to look at her, uh, her book, Mules and Men. Some of you, many of you who are from Florida know that book, a wonderful book of anthropology that explores black folk life in the South. And interestingly, this cover for her book was done by Covarrubias, showing a, a, a man playing the guitar, a woman um, with that same pose that somebody mentioned with the hand and the chin. But here I don't think it's boredom as much as, you know, I'm just really enjoying this, this music that I'm listening to. And on the left of the mule, of course, uh, in the background. But I show you this in juxtaposition to the sculpture by William Edmondson. William Edmondson was um, a, a sculptor, but also somebody who didn't know he was an artist until somebody said, you are an artist. He um, decides to become an artist late in life in Nashville, Tennessee, and he lives around a quarry filled with limestone. So he begins to carve limestone, and he's making these limestone headstones for um, black people in Nashville. And um, after um, some years of doing these pieces in the mid-30s, he's discovered, we talked about discovery a few minutes ago, and his works are brought to New York. And he is the first African-American to have a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art that takes place in 1937. And so I'm showing you this Edmondson and the, the Zora Neale Hurston book cover to remind you that the 30s and the kind of conclusion of the Harlem Renaissance, the New Negro Arts Movement, is in many respects a reformation, a re um, kind of evaluation of of black creativity that moves us from the kind of heady impressionistic years of, 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 of Langston Hughes and, and Meta Warwick Fuller's Ethiopia Awakening to the real on the ground work done by everyday ordinary people like Edmondson and artists like Zora Neale Hurston and Cobra Rubius who have a sense of the importance of the breadth of black expressivity, be it from the elite to the everyday ordinary man and woman. Well, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, we have gone a bit over our time. Uh, let me wrap things up here by asking, are there any questions that we have left unanswered? Do you have any comments or questions before we shut the seminar, <clears throat> shut the seminar down? I want to uh, thank you all for your intelligent and enthusiastic participation. We've gone over time because of all your wonderful questions and comments, and they, the, those questions and comments make these seminars what they are. Thank you very much for them. And Rick, I want to thank you for giving us a wonderful seminar tonight. I, I've, I've, I've heard this seminar before, as you know, but I, I learned something new every time. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
And ladies and gentlemen, uh, please continue to use the forum. I made some notes here. I'm going to be posting some uh, material to the forum tomorrow that I think might interest you. So please take a look uh, and share your approaches and discussion questions that work there. We'll monitor the forum until April 13th, which means that if some material comes across the forum that we need to pass on direct, we will do that and get back to you. Thank you very much for your participation again this evening. Let me close by reminding you to submit your evaluations. We do take a look at those, and we try to uh, perfect our seminars based on what you tell us. Now, to escape the classroom this evening, you go up to the upper left-hand corner of your screen. You'll see the word File. Click there. There will be a drop-down menu, and the last item is something like Leave Session. Once you click that, you're home free. Again, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and please be sure to submit those evaluations. Uh, check our website for our spring schedule, uh, and then we'll be pretty we'll pretty soon have our fall schedule up there. I think you'll like what you see. Hope you'll be back with us again sometime in the future. Thank you, and good evening.